the forsaken places of history, ominous and mysterious. Abandoned sites that symbolized the American dream of optimism and strength. Symbols of the confidence of a powerful nation. Light and shadow. But the American dream is not for everybody. Its promise as fragile as the buildings from its golden era. A high-tech fortress, a shield against nuclear missiles. You like to think you're smarter than the other guys, so there was a lot of poo-pooing about what the Russians had. A model facility for people with disabilities. But behind the walls, horror reigns. I saw a place with more than 3,000 people where we would put our dog for the weekend. And a working class vacation paradise hiding a deadly poison. Those dust particles are so small that it's a huge health problem. Secret worlds full of undiscovered stories. The water level would have been way up around that tree line there. It's really dropping fast. Places replete with memories. And the air was just full of marijuana. We thought everything was just great. In 1945, World War II is over. The big victor, the United States of America, leader of the free world, thanks to its army, its industry, and its okay, nuclear yeah, weapons. In 1949, the Soviet Union took its first steps in this new arms race with its own atom bomb. It's the beginning of a new conflict, the Cold War, we are on the brink of World War III. It would have been decided here, in North Dakota. You like to think you're smarter than the other guys, you know, so there was a lot of poo-pooing about what the Russians had, like it wasn't up to our standard. Well, look what they did first. They put up Sputnik, and they did all that technology too, so. Allies in World War II, adversaries in the Cold War, the USA and the Soviet Union. Both are leaders of a strong alliance, and both are armed with tens of thousands of nuclear weapons, enough to blow up our planet many times over. The USA wants to gain a crucial advantage. One of the men in charge of this. I'm Clint Eskelson, and Working here is like being a king on the throne because this system is one of the finest systems the U.S. Army has ever put together. The system here in North Dakota is called Safeguard. It is designed to identify incoming nuclear warheads and destroy them. To achieve this, Safeguard has dozens of interceptor rockets waiting in nuclear bomb-proof silos for their mission. Well, this is the co-located missile field for Safeguard. Safeguard had 100 interceptors, and of that was 36 of the Spartan, which is right here, and 48 of the Sprints. First to be launched would be Spartan. Under constant control and guidance by the computer, Spartan soars to intercept above the atmosphere. For intercepts of closer in targets, the smaller quick response sprint missile is used. Every missile should be able to destroy multiple warheads of an incoming rocket. A system to win World War III, would it have worked? Wouldn't an ABM system tend to prompt the opponent to launch a nuclear first strike? And on top of that, the costs for this system just skyrocketed as well. It is much cheaper to produce offensive nuclear weapons than a defensive system against, well, missiles coming at you at immense speeds. That safeguard itself could be the primary target of an attack as part of the equation. 
if we have a nuclear explosion up above, the walls of this pyramid is four foot thick, reinforced concrete with steel plating on the inside. The Safeguard Pyramid, with four gigantic radar antenna air rays pointing in all directions. To process the radar signals, the pyramid houses three underground levels packed with high-tech equipment. The four faces of the MSR contain more than 20,000 antenna elements. Some quarter of a million feet of coaxial cable connected the elements through the seven-foot thick face to corresponding electronic components inside the building. Many of the rooms housing critical equipment had to be shock-mounted to survive in a nuclear environment. Behind each face stands a feed horn used to transmit signals to and receive signals from the antenna. Processing equipment transforms the received signals into digital form used by the data processing system to control the equipment involved in an engagement. The two underground levels were home to the supercomputers of the U.S. military in those days. The radar can do surveillance. If you detect an object, then it can go back and track that object and know exactly where the object is going. And so then the computer is going to determine what the intercept process would be. We had 10 processor units, not one, 10. This was the biggest computer in the free world one time. Ultimately, the multiprocessor approach would deliver a computing speed of over 20 million instructions per second. Back then, staggeringly fast. Today, our smartphones are faster. In case of a Soviet nuclear attack, the safeguard officers would have been the first to recognize the danger on their radar screens. Two officers would have turned two keys simultaneously. The rest was left to technology. Safeguard could fire off 100 interceptor rockets in less than a minute. And of course, it was very hopeful that we'd never have to, especially when we would be in here and could withstand the blast and our family down in the housing area couldn't. You know, that's a hell of a thing to look at. Clint Ashkelson, retired now, is one of the last safeguard veterans. Today, he lives with his wife in a village not far from the facility. Nowadays, a large-scale nuclear war seems remote. You know, if the president gets involved in, in that and says, allows it to happen, it can happen. You know, I, I really don't think that's ever going to happen, but you can get some crazy guy and it might happen too. And I, I, should, I shouldn't say this, but our president of the United States right now is a questionable one anyway, so, but I don't think he'd ever, you know, get that crazy. For more than a century, America has been thinking of itself as the land of progress. Electricity, trains, cars, telegraphs, and phones improved the quality of life for countless people. But this brave new world is not for everybody. A clinic in Philadelphia shook the nation to its core, Penhurst. When I first came to Penhurst, I was 21 years old, just out of college. And I had no preparation for what I was about to see. I saw a place with more than 3,000 people where we would put our dog for the weekend. And something had to be done. I'm Jim Conroy, and I'm a scientist who has studied the quality of life among people with disabilities for 50 years. Progress in the USA tended to benefit mostly the white upper and middle class.
they see themselves as hard workers, happy consumers, and possessing a sound moral compass. But what about those who are mentally or physically disabled? The Penhurst Institution opened near Philadelphia in 1908. Its name back then, Eastern Pennsylvania State Institution for the Feeble-Minded and Epileptic. It took until the 1960s until people started to ask about the actual living conditions in such facilities. I drove from Washington, D.C up to here in my father's blue Chevy, and I was taken into a ward with about 50 men in various stages of undress, screaming and hitting themselves. It was achingly horrible that the richest nation on earth could do that to people. The idea of Penhurst was a good one the idea of a community that would allow people with special needs or who are differently abled to thrive and grow. Unfortunately, Penhurst suffered greatly from the ideas of overpopulation as well as severe underfunding. In 1968, television reporter Bill Baldini documented the shocking conditions at Penhurst. The 2,800 children, young and old alike, residing within the confines of Penhurst are for the most part protected from society and the granite wall of ignorance and social blindness protects society from them. The poorest people and the most vulnerable in our society, that urge to get rid of them, began here. And that took form in these institutions, 293 of them in the United States. And make no mistake, Every other country in the world built them too, after we did. At Penhurst, patients are removed from society and thus from the gene pool. The goal, to improve the population through reproduction control. Eugenics is the name of this pseudoscience. It segregates the disabled, sterilizes or even kills them. Its sad climax is the mass killing during the Nazi era in Germany. Very few people know that the eugenics movement began in 1880, roughly, and it happened in America and Britain. It's important to realize that the writings of our great jurist, Oliver Wendell Holmes, were used by Hitler in his writings in Mein Kampf. It took until 1970 for a law to be passed in the USA, which gave people with disabilities more rights. Jim Conroy was working on a study how to implement this law. The Penhurst Longitudinal Study was set up after the federal court in Philadelphia uh, decided that Penhurst by its very nature was unconstitutional. Now, the entire world is moving in the right direction, largely because of what happened here. Penhurst is only shut down for good in 1987, almost 20 years after the Baldini footage was broadcast to the world. In the last day in November, two men were still here. The superintendent and the local commissioner and I turned off the lights, locked the door, and the two gentlemen went to their new home. Today, Jim Conroy has a foundation to keep the memory of the history of Penhurst alive. In many ways, the American dream is most alive in the West and California. But outside the big cities, away from the glitz and glamour of Hollywood, the southern part of America's economically strongest state is a hot and dry desert. And in the middle of this desert, you can find Salton Sea, California's largest lake. My earliest memories of coming to Salton Sea from when I was about eight or 10 years old, my family and I would come down here. Uh, we'd go fishing for the whole weekend. Uh, we'd go home with dozens, sometimes hundreds of fish. It was an enjoyable place to come. My name is Randy Brown, and back then when I was a kid, Salton Sea was nothing like it is today. 
Today, Salton Sea is a dangerous salt lake in the desert. The Salton Sea lies in an area that's below sea level. The soil there is very salty because of its previously having been covered by the ocean. The Colorado River brought sediment down and created a dam and dried out that valley. Then over tens of thousands of years, whenever the river would flood, it would fill that valley and create the Salton Sea. And then the lake would dry up, and maybe 20 years later, it would flood again. That happened for the last time in 1905. A dam broke in the lower course of the Colorado River. The low ground of Salton Sea is flooded. Business-savvy townspeople put fish in the lake, and that created a vacation paradise from nothing. A sea in the desert with its wide, sandy beaches, no tides or dangerous undercurrents, and with literally millions of fish ready for the taking. This paradise attracts mostly the poorer population who cannot afford life on the Pacific coast. We didn't have a lot of money growing up, so it was a nice place for my parents to bring me and my brothers and sisters and spend the weekend without uh, spending a lot of money. Looking back now, it, it really was kind of the ordinary man's paradise. Salton Sea lies in one of the most intensively farmed regions of the United States. 48% of the population in the Imperial Valley depends on agriculture for their living. The runoff from these immense irrigated fields flows directly into the Salton Sea. Due to this and other factors, the amount of salt and fertilizer in the lake grows year by year. When the Colorado River flows in, it brings salt. The water evaporates and the salt stays behind. So slowly but surely, this lake became more and more salty and the game fish, the fish that people were trying to catch, eventually were unable to breed because the water got too salty and they started to die off. And sometime in the mid 70s, we had noticed that the shoreline was just covered in dead fish, like a blanket. And then it happened the next year and the next year, and it went from being this, something that had never happened before to eventually happening every year. Today, fish bones and shells line the shoreline. The water from the Colorado River has been rechanneled to San Diego. Farmers have switched to less water-intensive crops. Since this change, the water that flows into the lake has slowed to a trickle. So this is the what they call the sunken city, which has been underwater for 75 years or more. I came here as a kid in the 70s, the water level would have been way up around that tree line there. So that's a good several hundred yards, couple hundred meters away. And now, as you can see, it's way down. So it's, it's really dropping fast. In 2015, Randy Brown was the first person to walk around the entire Salton Sea in more than 50 degrees Celsius heat and extreme humidity. It's his way of raising awareness about the lake's slow death. T minus 10, 9, 8, 7, 6. Back to North Dakota in the Midwest to find a slumbering relic from a once looming World War III. Agriculture dominates most people's lives here as well. But during the Cold War, another important employer existed here, the US Army. They started with the construction of a nuclear fortress in 1970. Well, the first time I came onto the site was probably late June of 1972. Everybody that worked here was aware of what the project was about. For a lot of us that worked out here, it was a very nice job, very good job. My name is Carol Goodman, and when I worked here at the site, my position was called Administrative Non-Supervisory Employee. The 
USA invested billions into defense systems to protect their country against Soviet nuclear missiles. 17 so-called safeguard bases are planned. Their main mission, protecting US nuclear missiles. This is the Minuteman Intercontinental Ballistic Missile. 1,000 of these missiles are on a 24-hour alert throughout the northwestern and midwestern portion of the United States. These are located at Minot Air Force Base, North Dakota, Grand Forks Air Force Base, North Dakota. The pyramid and its missile fields are the heart of the safeguard bays. Clustered around them, you find more buildings, among them a church, a gym, and a community center. One of the immediate problems was housing. Facilities were made available by the Army, for military and key civilian personnel assigned to the site. All were part of the only new Army base installed since World War II. At the peak of employment for the safeguard system, there were 3,100 people working. So you saw businesses grow, you saw new businesses open. You start seeing things you never even thought of before. You know, how long it took to get into your local bank to cash a check and waiting in line for a table at a restaurant. The nuclear fortress becomes the driving force behind a small economic boom in North Dakota. Now people don't have to rely only on farming to make a living, and that makes Safeguard very popular with the locals. In faraway Washington, D.C., the program is controversial, politically and militarily. Safeguard costs billions. And whether it really can protect the USA in a nuclear war is uncertain. When developing ABM systems, you always have to consider your adversary. If you develop ABM systems, there is a probability, bordering uncertainty, that your adversary will do the same. That means you have to expand your offensive capacity substantially to ensure you can beat these anti-ballistic rocket systems. You basically have to pump money into two buckets. In the long run, even the USA cannot really afford that. As the ABM program developed, so it seems, did opposition to its very existence. From the beginning, the program was controversial. Very little question but that the Soviet Union was impressed with the obvious intent of the United States to proceed with a large-scale deployment of the safeguard system. And this led to the successful SALT-1 negotiations. SALT-1 is an agreement which limits nuclear weapons. At the same time, the USA and the Soviet Union signed the so-called ABM Treaty. Each side is allowed to have only one ballistic missile defense base. The base in North Dakota has been finished, but cannot protect the country all by itself. I don't remember exactly how it started to circulate through the people that worked here. You know, everybody was aware of the SALT treaties that were taking place because that was, you know, started in late 72, 73, you know, into 74 as this was being built. We were not given briefings on, okay, this is going to happen, this is gonna happen, uh, you know, this is gonna be shut down, so many people are gonna be transferred out. But it was obvious, you know, that things were going to wind down. On April the 1st, 1975, the nuclear fortress goes operational. Six months later, the US Congress cancels all further funding for the missile defense program. On February the 10th, 1976, the base is shut down after less than a year. People started moving away, so the population dropped very, very quickly. It was a depressing time, I do remember that. And it took a long time for the atmosphere to change. North Dakota falls back into a deep slumber, a province in the middle of nowhere at the edge of the USA. Carol Goodman works for the county and actively supports the preservation of the pyramid. Far away in the east, in Pennsylvania, 
the place where the Declaration of Independence was signed and where you can find the symbol of freedom, the Liberty Bell. Proclaim liberty throughout all the land unto all the inhabitants thereof. The lettering on it promises. But this promise does not hold true for all people. Even as late as the 1980s, people with disabilities were separated from the rest of society and had to live out their lives in institutions such as Panhurst. You can't imagine how isolated it felt and how empty these people's lives were because there was just nothing for them to do. My name is Judith Gran. I'm a lawyer specializing in the rights of persons with disabilities who worked on the Penhurst litigation. At the beginning of the 20th century, land 50 kilometers outside of Philadelphia is still affordable. The location seems perfect. There is a river and a railroad connection. It's easy to transport people and goods. However, for the patients in Penhurst, this remote location is dangerous. When a person came to Penhurst, they may never see their family again because that's how hard it was to travel to such a remote area. Because of that, the family doesn't have a very accurate idea of the care that their loved one is getting. In 1968, the conditions at Penhurst became public for the first time. A legal battle ensued, which dragged on for years. When I first visited Penhurst, it was many years after the original expose that Bill Baldini did in the 60s. I had seen photos of conditions there, and I knew that people were really warehoused and treated worse than animals in the zoo. There is a reason for this comparison with the zoo. In his 1968 investigative film, the reporter Bill Baldini compares the way animals are kept at zoos with the conditions in Penhurst. Some zoos in the United States spend more money for the daily upkeep of their large animals than the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania allows Penhurst to spend on its 2,800 retarded children. Five of the largest zoos spend $7.15 per day on their wards. Penhurst can only afford $5.90. My first feeling when I first saw the conditions of the institution was sadness, I, I think grief, that people were torn away from their communities and their families and forced to live in such abnormal and, and unnatural conditions. For the first time in 1970, a law formulates a precise definition of people with mental disabilities. Simultaneously, requirements are set for institutions that accommodate people with mental disabilities. Penhurst does not meet these requirements. It still takes another 17 years and several lawsuits for the institution to be shut down. The main points of Judge Broderick's ruling were that Penhurst had violated people's rights to safety and freedom from harm and freedom from restraint, adequate food, shelter, medical care, all the basic things that people are entitled to. Since that time, Penhurst is one of the worst examples of the government's mistreatment of mentally disabled people in the USA, but not the only one. The legal fight for the facility leads to clinics and institutions across the country being inspected and shut down. I've seen firsthand the harms of segregation and the benefits of inclusion. And I can't imagine ever going back to thinking that anybody should have to be taken away from a normal environment. Slowly, the idea prevails that people with disabilities should not be locked away, but included. 
a sea change after decades of horror. It was wonderful to see the success of our efforts to make sure that the services in the community were of good quality so that nobody in Philadelphia now has to leave their, their home community to receive services. By now, 293 institutions like Penhurst have been shut down. It's the end of a dark period. Four, three, two, one, fire. In the mid-70s, the United States is a heavily armed superpower, the unchallenged leader of the West. At the same time, the brief era of the safeguard complex in North Dakota comes to an end. Especially in the patriotic Midwest, the self-image of a nuclear superpower starts to fade. I still believe that as far as people, we can all get along. But the governments are the ones that, to me, cause the problems. And the other thing is money. Our whole world, especially now, is all about money. And like I say, I'm just a dumb guy living here. The smart guys are supposed to be figuring that out. Hello, my name's Neil Holman. Everybody calls me Buzzy. North Dakota, one of the most sparsely populated states in the U.S. A large part of the U.S. nuclear arsenal is stationed here. In 1970, the construction of a unique missile fortress started for the protection of the nuclear arsenal, and that meant lots of jobs for the region. When this place was built, there was like 1,200 people a, a shift out here. So it was a big deal. Site preparation in North Dakota was progressing on schedule in order to be ready to receive the large complex assemblage of equipment. Over 8,000 tons of steel reinforcing bars and more than 58,000 cubic yards of concrete were required. I was doing carpenter work at that time and working for like six bucks an hour. And everybody up here was making big money. So anything would have been great. Not all Americans embraced the nuclear efforts of their military. The Vietnam War and fear of nuclear annihilation trigger protests. Even picketing the construction site of the new base in North Dakota was considered. My dad said, don't you go up there. I said, I won't. Well, after hearing that, then two and other buddies I had, we said, we got to go up there. There was a couple of hippies going at it, and the air was just full of marijuana. We thought everything was just great. The protest in North Dakota remained peaceful and relaxed, almost cheerful. The police do not interfere. When I got home that night, my dad said, what'd you do today? I said, drove around a little bit. I said, I went to work out at the farm for a while. The local newspaper covers the protest. Well, the next morning in the Grand Forks Herald, they had taken a picture that was me and my two buddies, and he's seen it. And he was pissed off. It's one of the maddest he's ever been at me. I think it wasn't that I came here, but I lied to him. Ever since, Buzzy has been fascinated by the nuclear fortress. After its shutdown, the few maintenance jobs stayed in the hands of the government. But in 1991, the facility is handed over to the state of North Dakota, and his chances improved, and a dream came true. The first year, I was just a heavy equipment operator. The second year, they made me foreman. The third year, they made me site manager foreman. But the old missile base continues to fall apart. 
Neil Holman and his crew tear down the civilian buildings step by step. They are still looking for a new purpose for the pyramid. Would I like to see it reopen? I would love to see it reopen. Probably not as an anti-ballistic site, but since it's here, the infrastructure is still good. So use it for something. There are plans to convert the pyramid into a data center. Until then, Neil Buzzy Holman will keep on cutting the grass here. The day of the free ride is over. Let's return to Salton Sea. Once a Californian vacation paradise, today it's an affordable retirement community at best. We had a friend, he toured the area everywhere. He knew where all the camping stuff was, so he told us to go along with him, so that's how we got started down here. I am Jane Southworth, and my husband, Wendell Southworth. We had a lot of fun, met a lot of nice people, and I really kind of miss it. The Southworth story is typical of America's white middle class. Since the 80s, retirement benefits have been dwindling for many. The day of the free ride is over. The Southworths retire in their mid-60s. At that time, they still live in the Los Angeles region. But their retirement benefits won't allow them to live big. Their dream, Bombay Beach to live at the place where they had been vacationing for years. Well, we, we put our house up for sale in Riverside and sold it. First people who looked at it bought it, so we had to move out here and had no other place to live. <laughs> people were friendly and, you know, it just, you, like, we put our mobile home out here and we, go off and wouldn't lock the door. Everybody was watching for you, you know. In the 70s, Salton Sea is a vacation paradise for tens of thousands of city dwellers every year. The town sees some changes in the 90s. The lake recedes. And instead of vacationers, it's retired folks who cannot afford other places who start to come. They don't want to have their good times ruined in spite of the dying lake right in front of them. I had a Porsche engine in it when I bought it, with the dual carburetors and all that good stuff. It, uh, they get up and move pretty good, because there's, there's no weight to them. free to drive and free to drive, no matter where you go. You could go. go just about anywhere you wanted to go. Uphill, downhill, and all around town. <laughs> the most popular meeting point in Bombay Beach then and today is the Ski Inn. It lies 68 meters below sea level, which makes it the lowest bar in the Western Hemisphere. The fact that the Southwest started working again every day wasn't planned. A friend of Jane's is to blame. She wanted to borrow the ski in. She wanted to buy it, but she didn't have any money. So it was, well, we'll help you out. We'll, we'll put the down payment down. Well, we had $80,000 invested in down payment on it, so. Well, we had to save our investment. Oh, we, just, we went to work. Just went to work. And, Work, 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 and caught it, got all the bills caught up. The ski inn became a hot tip among adventure tourists. They praised the drinks and called the food daring. Wendell sat on that chair and rested all the time. <laughs> well, he can't cook. <laughs> he burns everything. So he was the bartender and I was the cook. But I started out as a bartender, so I could do it all. I didn't need him. <laughs> 25 years, you've got a long time to work it out. Yeah. <laughs>
The Southworths ran the ski inn for 25 years before selling it in 2019. With the money from the sale, they're both in their 90s, they retired for good this time. Others are just getting started. Artists from San Diego and Los Angeles bought properties at affordable prices and are beginning to show their art. It looks as if Bombay Beach is about to change again. And they have, they have bought a lot of property down here, especially, you know, things that have gone up for taxes, because then they get it cheap. They just pay the taxes and it's theirs. A renaissance for the arts. Giving up is not an option even more so for the Southworths, being so close to the old shoreline. <laughs> the underbelly of the American dream, it has to do with economic loss and the loss of dignity. No other name says that like Penhurst, where thousands of mentally disabled people were locked away. There are people that come here with a respect in their heart and a curiosity as to what this place is. And there is another brand of people that come here that have absolutely no respect. But it is my great hope that the reason is because they just don't understand. I really enjoy teaching them. My name is Jim Werner. I'm the operations manager here at the Penhurst Historic Site. Penhurst started admitting people with mental disabilities in 1908. At the beginning, this is an improvement for those who were forced to live in prisons before. After the institute was shut down, there was no use for Penhurst anymore. The psychiatric clinic starts to fall apart. From 1987 to 2008, the site was abandoned. It was like walking into a forest almost, anywhere. Massive amounts of damage happened at the hands of vagrants and vandals. We've reclaimed most of our courtyards at this time. What kind of started turning the site around was that influx of revenue from a successful business venture. Today, Penhurst is owned by private investors. They want to keep the memory of the institution's dark history alive, a project that needs to be economically viable. Other than renting out the place as an event venue, so-called paranormal excursions are a big hit. Or put simply, ghost hunting. Jim Werner guides these ghost tours across the grounds. When a person thinks of, oh, I wonder if there's a ghost in that building, well, our buildings kind of have the look like there should be ghosts in them. About twice a week, up to 20 ghost hunters meet up here. We take them around the property. We teach them about what was here, why it was here, how it was here, and how it ended. Tonight, uh, we're gonna be here for around eight hours of paranormal investigation. We're gonna be heading over to our Rockwell tunnels, which were opened last year. Lots of different paranormal events, things like shadows, um, noises, uh, different voices that have been heard. So what we have, everyone, is um, some really cutting edge paranormal investigation gear that you guys are gonna have an opportunity to use tonight. We have some EMF meters. These are meters that measure electromagnetic fields. We also have a thermal imaging camera. So if we get an anomaly, you can click it. Um, and then finally, one of the newest pieces of equipment we have is a spirit box. This device reportedly allows spirits and entities to communicate and form words. It is said that the ghost tours were a compromise that everyone agreed upon, but of all places, does it have to be this place of real suffering where people look for ghosts? Is there anyone in here? Would you like us to leave? There isn't sufficient government funding to maintain such a memorial. We wouldn't be able to pay people to rehab items for us to display and for us to pay historians to come in and tell the story, unless we had those bedrock money makers, that 
being the way it is keeps this from being a Walmart. It keeps this place from being a, a barren field where what was here is lost to history. The current revenues barely cover the upkeep of the building. Any plans to open a museum of the history of psychiatry are wishful thinking. If I could do anything with this site, I would invest in the rehabilitation of as many buildings as possible. I would love to turn this place into an interactive museum, a place of, as, as my good friend Dr. Jim Conroy says, a place of conscience. Jim Werner is a father of two disabled daughters himself. Therefore, approaching the story of Penhurst with respect is close to his heart. Salton Sea was once a booming region, a manifestation of the American dream. Today, the area looks like the vision of a dystopian future where civilization as we know it has ceased to exist. For a long time, this has attracted dropouts, people who want to find themselves, the homeless and artists. Why would I exist in something that's akin to an apocalyptic wasteland? Is that what you're asking? <laughs> it's good practice. It's. Who knows what the future holds? We might all have to live like this one day. We're in East Jesus. This is a uh, artist community and museum. Hello, my name is Brian Finch. I am a volunteer here, and I've been associated with the place about three years now. Hi, I'm Copper. I'm a traveling artist and currently the volunteer summertime caretaker. East Jesus is an artist colony not far from the shoreline of Salton Sea, built in the middle of the desert. Shacks, abandoned trailers, and slept together accommodations. Everything is makeshift on purpose, just like the life plans of the people here. They all have one thing in common. They can't afford anything else. I think all it is is people are, are trying to live however they can. There's people that moved out here because they had to cho make a choice between, say, health care and housing. They couldn't afford both of them. Most of the people that come out here and create work are normal 9 to 5 people who don't like being normal 9 to 5 people. A lot of us like to come out and be weird in the desert. <laughs> to them, life on the edge of Salton Sea is freedom. However, the environment is hostile. In the summer, temperatures run up to 50 degrees Celsius, and there's a looming environmental disaster waiting right outside their front doors. What looks like danger for only a few turns out to be a massive health problem upon closer inspection. You might say, well, it's the desert. How many people live there? So there are actually 600,000 people that live uh, in the two valleys surrounding the Salton Sea. The people there are poor, they're Hispanic, uh, they have very little political power. And as the Salton Sea is dried up, these beaches create a huge health hazard for these people. The water is evaporating. What's left is dust, salt, and fertilizer residues. The wind that blows constantly in this area picks up all of this and spreads it in the atmosphere. Government agencies calculated the cost of refilling the Salton Sea at 5 billion US dollars. That's considered cost prohibitive, but the fact that this situation will create 50 billion dollars in medical cost is swept under the rug because the dust is responsible for an increase in asthma and other lung disease. It affects me personally as well, since myself um, and my family developed asthma while living here. I never had problems before. Without a political lobby, it will be hard for people at Salton Sea to save their lake and the air they breathe. The dust particles are microscopically small and toxic not only for the respiratory system. But actually those dust particles are so small that it also gets into the body and affects your heart, the health of your brain, your immune system can even create problems for pregnant women with the fetus. So it's a huge health problem. But for the East Jesus artists, life here is their own version of the American dream. It is a place where you can find your own true self, 
a refuge from materialism. Far away from the financial constraints that they and America's middle class have to struggle with every day. Well, originally I got a degree in art and then shortly after graduating found myself with three jobs and none of them were doing art. I got the third job because I needed gas money between jobs one and two. And because I do not want to go back, I found myself here. <laughs> they take care of tourists and as a byproduct, they create art to fill the statue's park of East Jesus. Hello. Thank you for visiting. This place helps me live the lifestyle that I've always wanted to live, which is being my own boss. And a lot of people say, oh, well, you're, you're living the dream. And I'm like, I mean, you, you could too. It's simply a decision to do it a different way. And this is clearly a different way. So I like it. <laughs> In the end, one thing is true. In America, everybody has to find their own dream. And there's not a blueprint for that. I don't know if the American dream really did exist. The idea that you could uh, have the freedom to apply yourself and be able to buy your own home if that existed, that's, that's gone. America, the land of unlimited opportunity? America, the bulwark against Bolshevism? That world order is history now. No matter if it's healthcare, water, or infrastructure, today money rules the world. And unless there's a commercial angle to it, Many of the symbols of what America once was have been left to their decay. <laughs>